My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. I've been working really hard to deliver amazing guests and great content to you. But before we get into this week's episode, I just need your help with two things. Number one, hit that subscribe or follow button on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on so that you're one of the first to get notified when new episodes drop in the future. Number two, go to the TamilCreator.com to take a two minute quiz that will tell you what kind of creator you are. I would love to hear what results you get. Your support means more than you'll ever know. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, this is another episode of the Tamil Creator. This is your host, Era. And today I have a very special guest. It's, uh, I like to call him the modern Renaissance Tamil man. And what I mean by that is he's a man that's quite knowledgeable about everything. Like literally when me and this guy talk, we can talk about anything. And you guys know this guy. He's both famous for his voice and beautiful face. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you, Mr. Ari Suryamuthi. Suryamuthi. Did I get that? Indeed, indeed. Yes, I got it. I always mess up the, the guest's last yeah, name. Your last name is quite difficult too. It's just that that PH in the middle of it is, is difficult. Trust. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, a couple other things about Ari. Ari's about to become a dad. Uh, you know, I can, for whatever reason, I always pictured Ari to be a great dad. So I think uh, <laughs> it's going to suit him quite well. And obviously how I know Ari is, you know, it's a funny story. I was telling Claudia before this, which is, when I knew Ari before, which isn't really knowing him, which was uh, when he was at U of T very briefly. And like, I saw him around like at Tamil like events. I always thought he was like a bit of a douche because I didn't know him. And then I met him and I got to know him and I was like, wow, I was totally off. This guy's like one of the nicest guys that I know. Um, so <laughs> that shows you how good my, like, I guess rate, like, I guess first impression radar is or whatever it is. But um, yeah, you know, before I kind of blab further, I'll let the man himself introduce himself and we'll get into it. Well, thank you for having me on this podcast. It's good to be on the other side of the interviewing table. I, I'm not, not to toot my own horn, but I guess some people would know me based on the fact that I have done interviews in the Tamil community for TC and many other outlets. But uh, I think you were right when you first said I was a douche because I probably was. I mean, <laughs> we're talking every, we're talking what? <laughs> Uh, 2000s, you know, I think everyone can declare that they were somewhat douchey at that time, right? <laughs> um, but my name is Ari, and uh, I like to do all things media. And I met Era a long, long time ago. I don't specifically know when, but it must have been at a TSA event mm -hmm. when we were both just looking for some free food on a Thursday at, you know, Sid Smith or MedSci or wherever uh, on the UFT campus. And uh, since then, we've uh, known each other, followed each other in some circles here and there. And uh, see each other at a lot of great parties. Yeah, and I, I think another thing to add is, if, for those of you who don't know, Ari is the famous face of TC on the street, among a few other faces, but probably the most prominent and uh, very impactful at the beginning when, and continuing to help with uh, tamilculture.com. So just wanted to give him that sh shout out. Um, you know, and, you know, I think Ari kind of brought up a good segue, something I want to talk to him about, which was kind of, you know, friendships, you know, like the different nature of friendships. So like, like Ari and myself, we've known each other for a while. I would say we've probably known each other better in the last three to five years, I would say, um, you know, TC started it and then kind of just other things as well. And we got more mutual friends, um, like, you know, shout out to my boy Vaz. Um, so one of the things I want to talk to you about was like friendships and the nature of it. So, you know, I'm not even sure how to get into this, but I feel like there's so many people that we were friends with in the past that we're not friends yeah. with anymore. And like, just like, you know, the sadness of friendships. And the reason I also brought it up was like, I read that, you know, Norman, Art Norman Powell article on uh, the Players Tribune today. And it just got me thinking about relationships and like, you know. Making a lot of tears flow. Yeah. So maybe let's talk about that. Let's just start off with that. Well, I mean, hey, the friendships as a, you know, you know what I'll say? I'll say, I'll say this. Um, when I, uh, let's put it this way. When I meet new people, like when I met my wife before she was my wife, she would complain about some of her friendships as we all do to each other's significant other's friend, other friends and everything. And I always said, look, this person might not be here now, but who's to say they won't be here in a year. You know, sometimes there are excuses you can make for your friends because they're being a quote unquote, a bad friend, but they might come 
at a different time of your life. I, I think friend, friendship is free flowing. Sometimes they're not in your life for 10 years and then they could suddenly be a part of your life. Uh, to all the married folk out there, they've had bridesmaids, they've had groomsmen. How many of them are still in your lives? So you'll be surprised if anyone doesn't know that a lot of those friendships don't actually last, but some of them actually do come back. It just, I think it's a free flowing thing like a river and I don't, I don't really define it as one thing or another. I will say this as, as I say that, that there are those first level like first level or first tier friends your inner circle if you will and then there are the ones on the periphery your your secondary and tertiary friends and as you move along in life some of those are the ones that kind of get sacrificed based on time location it's a big factor but you never know when you bump into anyone again so it's free flowing that's what i that's my definition of friendship it's how always changing you, how do you feel about friendships that are based on history versus kind of actual you know, <laughs> like meaningful, like, you know, value there in that like context or relationship. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing, yeah, that's the thing, like I have a set group, I have a group of friends from high school and that was over 20 years ago. Right. But then you think about individually in that crew, maybe there are some people that I'm not as close to as the others. And then you also ask, Hey, if I met this person now, would I be their friend? I mean, would they be my friend? I always think that I'm, uh, I, I play a little in, off the cusp and I, I, I say a lot of things that are kind of controversial here and there especially at the worst times so they might not be my friend based on that so history it, it plays a trick in your mind of nostalgia like that smell that you smell and you're like well where's that coming from that was from that old apartment I lived in like 10 years ago it, it brings back all these memories but then do you want that smell right now <laughs> In a successful relationship, what would you say are the, the ingredients, like if you were to break down the percentage, like what would be the like history, what would be they're there for you and need them, what is, you know, they're fun, like whatever the different ingredients for you is, but like what would you say they are? I think someone who's very close to you, um, obviously you would value their time and their time in your life, especially at their emotional time. Are you someone they can talk to vice versa as well? So the trust and the dependability of that person is really what I think defines someone who is a friend versus someone who you kind of trade favors for, but don't really count. Maybe that's how I would look at it, where you can just unconditionally go to them and, and cry on their shoulder or ask for anything and they'll do it for you. One of my buddies told me uh, something funny. He's like, if I'm ever in a jam, and this was obviously drunk talk, if I'm ever <laughs> in a jam and I call you, you better like you better come to my location right away. And I'm like, what if I was like about to close a deal with someone like on a first, like we, we went, we were at the bar, we went to her place. What if I was about to close the deal? He's like, I don't care. You better show up. I'm like, what if I finish? What if I be, be the, like the two minute man and just show up? That, is that okay? And he's like, listen, you better show up. That's all he kept saying. And I'm like, I get it. That, that's kind of what you want from your buddy. That's, that's a good way of uh, defining it. Um, so like other kinds of relationships, you know, beyond like friends or like family and like, you know, tell us about your family, your upbringing, whatever you want to kind of share. Um, you know, I think I have uh, nothing unique in terms of my upbringing from uh, Tamil immigrants uh, came, they came in the late eighties, just like a lot of the ones in here in Toronto, at least where I live. And um, the difference between my family and others, I would say is that my mom has Parkinson's and she got diagnosed very early. So because of that, it was difficult for her to work moving forward. So she did become the stay at home mom that she never really wanted to be. I, she was outgoing. She, she got her college degree here. She, she loved education. She loved working. And, and, and she, she didn't like being at home as much, but she loved seeing us grow up and helping us move along the way. Nothing unique there. I suppose a lot of people are in similar and worse situations. My dad's like one of those guys at the village parties who always <laughs> speaks on the mic. So maybe that's where I got it from. He's always cracking jokes at all these events he's running around where my mom can't find him. I know my wife has the same issue with me. So clearly there is, there's things being passed down subconsciously, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I have a great family. I have a, a younger brother who's uh, in the TPS, the police force here in Toronto. So, and we used to watch cops as kids and America's most wanted. So I know where he got that from. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, very typical. Uh, we're loving, we're not the closest. I mean, we're not, you know, sitting around talking about our fears and everything, but we're as close as we can be for a uh, survival of the thinnest immigrant family that came in the late 80s. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up that last comment. I feel like um, I know two kinds of fam families in the Tamil community, at least with friends that I know. And the type of dynamic they have, typically, I'm generalizing here, but 
it deals with the ratio of girls to guys that are kids. So what I mean by that is <laughs> I know families that have like three or four girls and like they're all super yeah. close. But then I might know a family with like, say, mind that have like two or three guys and like maybe one girl or like all guys and they're not as close. So I feel like I don't know if it's like generalizing, like maybe when there's like more women or like like more males versus females, there's like an impact on kind of how close the family is. But it's just interesting you brought that up because I feel like I would do anything for my family, like my siblings, etc. Uh, but it's not like other families that I know where like they talk about everything. I find it very strange. I probably talk more with my friends than I do with my family about like things that I'm worried about or like my dreams or something. I don't know. It's weird. Hey, you're right. I mean, that's not uncommon. You don't choose your family. They're just kind of there. You're, you're born into them pretty much their dynamic yeah. and, and your siblings too, but then you choose your friends. So you choose who you want to tell your secrets to and, yeah. and be vulnerable with, right? Like that's what I mean. Cry on someone's shoulder. You choose that. Whether it's your family or your friends, I hope someone has someone like that. And that's kind of the, the direction you want to go in a positive life, I think. Do you feel like as you get older, you want to be closer with your brother? Or are you trying to make more of a effort versus when you were younger? Yeah, I think I, I think uh, I think as anyone gets more mature, like, for example, when you're growing up and you know, let's say you're in your teens and your brother's in his teens or your siblings in their teens, you're going to be constantly fighting about dumb shit all the time, right? Yeah. Like just inconsequential stuff. But as you grow older, you, you start talking about some actual, actual real problems and, and thinking about age and your parents' age and how you deal with an older parent really does bring the family together. And, and yeah, I would love to get closer to my brother. Yeah. He just got married. He's probably going to have a kid soon. Like I think just natural forces of nature bring you closer. Hopefully you have a good relationship but it's not uncommon for family to just hate each other. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's true. not at all. I don't know. People sometimes seem surprised at that, but I don't think it's that uncommon. I agree with you. Uh, one of the driving forces for me behind trying to be closer with family. And I, like you said, it's natural. Like as you get older, you kind of think about what's important, especially like, you know, for like me and Claudia, where we have kids and like my brother has yeah. a kid and like you have a lot sister. of siblings so yeah and my sister has a kid my brother i'm sure when he gets married he'll have a kid so just kind of like i'm trying to be more proactive in that and i read this article i think it's called the tales end and you would like it because it breaks down the mathematics behind after the age of 25 or 30 you would have seen your parents if you stick to the math of for like 95 percent of like what you would see them for the rest of your life because it tell it basically tells you oh you'll probably see them once every month for the rest of your life and compared to your friends, like blah, blah, blah. So like that really made me sad. And I was like, you know what? I need to be more proactive in seeing my parents. So instead of at once a month, I, I stepped it up to like once a week to kind of like- Good For you. COVID. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I feel like quality of time comes from quantity of time. So um, yeah, so I guess also, you know, we talked about COVID, which I just quite mentioned as well. How yeah. has COVID, um, you know, affected you personally and maybe from a pro professional point of view as well? I think um, I would first like to say that I was privileged enough to continue working during COVID. I, I do many things that I'll touch on that a little later, but because of that, uh, my family and I had a chance to reset, just take time for ourselves. It sucks. I mean, if you're, forget the financials and everything. If you're at a point, if you're at a point where you're complaining about not being able to go out for dinner, I mean, you're missing the point of what's going on in the world. But at the same time, I get that struggle too. Um, because everyone just gets used to their comfort zone. So that's cool. But for, for, for my family and I, we got to save more money. We got to really reset some basics. We moved during COVID, which was a journey and, and uh, we got pregnant too. So it, it's been great uh, personally, professionally. It's, it, it's uh, my freelance career is, was on pause. So that's uh, anyone who, who does freelance or has their own business knows having a whole year without revenue from that source is detrimental in some way. But uh, because I have different streams of uh, work, I, I was able to still work. So it's been, it's, it, to me, it, it, it was a great year of just slowing down. So tell the people like in terms of, you know, you mentioned, yeah. um, you know, all the, I, I call it side hustle work, but you know, freelance work. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you do full time? Maybe tell people that. So um, I, I'm a technologist or a specialist in technology at a university, the University of Guelph Humber. Picture me like a labby where um, I'm sure everyone knows what that is. And if they don't, it's like uh, we don't teach the theoretical. We teach the practical of uh, and for me, that's uh, with equipment. So cameras, 
editing technology, editing software, VR or XR, AR technology, anything to do with any of that, um, and services in facilities like TV studios. I teach that. I help teach that class. So that's that's what I do on a, on the daily basis. And of course, I do freelance work where I'm out on the other side of the mic um, here for TC and for many other uh, many other businesses. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. So how did you? Like, I know for many years, you're kind of doing more of the freelancing and you're kind of trying to avoid, you know, getting locked <laughs> up in the nine to five. So I guess, number one, what made you decide to take on a nine to five? I'm calling it that, but, it, you know, it's obviously changed. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And then the second one, second part of that question is, how did you land that opportunity? Like, tell tell us, like, the journey of kind of getting that opportunity. Well, yeah, I, and I know you lamented this just for that second, but like that nine to five label, you know, when I picture a nine to five, I picture someone who is uh, maybe unhappy or content with whatever it is they're doing. No, no offense to anyone, but some t- in the negative aspect, I picture someone at a desk somewhere, just literally punching in numbers. And I know that's not every job. That's not even half the jobs, but that's what I, that's what I picture when someone in the freelance circle says, Oh, I would never do a nine to five. And we've been there. We've talked about this. Um, but for me, um, I, I just applied to a lot of spaces where I thought um, my skills would be useful and my degree does help me um, having one from Ryerson for radio and television arts. It's to toot my own horn there. It is a highly respected degree in terms of the arts um, and film, you know, any, anything to do with the media. So someone on, on their team was actually from the same program. So, you know, okay. game recognized game, right? So <laughs> they, uh, so they brought me in for the interview and, and, and then it was, it was actually right after my wedding, which is hilarious. Like the day after my wedding, I had to do this interview. So, you know, I wasn't in the best state of mind, but I think he knew that. And he's like, Oh, you just got married too. So, and you nailed it. So that was my journey there. And that was after applying for a very long time. I'm not going to say like, I just applied and I got something. It took a year, a whole solid year of applying, if not more while I freelanced during that time, but it wasn't a conscious decision. I just liked the jobs that I just applied to the jobs that I thought I would enjoy. Got it. And what about the, um, like the contract jobs or like the, um, side hustle kind of things like how did you you know it's like it's, it sounds like easy to do but like it, i think it takes quite a bit of work and networking um to kind of create those opportunities for yourself so how did you do that um to be honest uh again yeah you're right it's uh about the networking it, it in today's world we prioritize a lot of uh, technical skills but i think I, I i don't know where i got it from like maybe it was it was my dad but i i was born with a lot of a lot of the soft skills that employers love and people just when you meet them they love and I think that's what got me in front of the camera and behind right so when I would network I would present myself as a friendly face who who's very knowledgeable can help and that that struck a chord with a lot of people who are in the same situation it's not like I was aiming for like getting a job at like Sony to do something I was just just starting out and then I met people like you who are in the same boat hey let's try something let's let's do something and I think that goes back to how you freelance in general and you just don't expect the most and you just take the jobs that will help you get to the job that you want. So what is the ultimate job or pinnacle that you're kind of aiming for in say the next three to five years? Like you have this job that you enjoy, like I, you're like a natural teacher. Like I feel like you're good at breaking down complex topics or just you know things and making it very easy for anyone to understand. So I feel like teaching is natural for you. And then you also have this, you know, on the side where you kind of do a lot of things in front of the camera, you do podcasts. Um, so like, yeah, where do you like, how does that all kind of fit together in the big, the big, the big dream that you have of yours? You know, you know that, that that's the thing with me is I, I don't really have, and I know this is contrary to popular um, belief, I guess, on what people want to do. And in answering this question, and uh, yes, I do go on a lot of rants. So that's what you're going to experience in this <laughs> podcast, unfortunately, to everyone listening. But I, my dreams change a lot. And I think it's like a, a mild form of ADD in terms of those dreams that like every year I'll have some, a different goal. Like I, I do have the pipe dream of becoming some sort of uh, Joe Rogan type podcaster in some way. I do have this even more mild pipe dream of like, I used to want to become an actor so badly. Shout out to Voss. Uh, you'll hear his name quite a bit. And like, I see his struggle and journey being an actor and I love it and I hate it. Right. So, but it, it, you know, it's just, I, for me, I feel like it's too late for that, but you know, if casting agents are out there, just uh, listen to my voice <laughs> in my face, but um, so yeah. So that uh, my unanswer is I don't really have a set one It changes a lot. It, it definitely has to do with the space, uh, the media space. And um, I do have uh, aspirations in education as well. 
So that's always like, even though that's a, the, my major form of time right now, of time commitment, uh, I do want to pursue that as not necessarily a backup because I do both. I don't even call them freelance gigs. I just call them other things that I do, right? Because to me, everything matters in the same way. It's getting really spiritual right now, but no, uh, keep going. We'll uh, keep, keep, it going. <laughs> but that's it. I, it. There's no set to destination, something to do in education. I would love to fully teach at one point. I'd love to do more YouTube stuff where I do teach on YouTube because that's kind of a general progression. It's like, I have an army of students that still want to watch some of the things that I do. So, you know, it's embedded right there and then more podcast stuff. See you more with the podcast, of course, and yeah. uh, the TC stuff that we do together. So yeah, it's, it's all over the place, but it's there. I can definitely see you as like a, a brown, you know, I'm using color of your skin, like brown Joe Rogan. Like, I feel like you have the personality. Rogan. You have the knowledge. And I feel like, you know, you, I think you would be able to get good guests. So, you know, if you have a, a podcast down the line, I'm, I'll definitely be uh, listening. So um, <laughs> you'll be no, definitely like, be a guest too, especially for the air. So era's most famous first um, question when he meets a, uh, uh, a group of people if it's especially a party is hey who do you think pays on the first date so <laughs> he's definitely going to be on a podcast related to that right did i ever get your answer on that question like who who pays on the first date man you know like i think when we originally asked it like 10 years ago i don't know what my answer was then i really don't what's your right answer now, now? Right, right now if you <laughs> I, I call it like there's the game right like do you want to play the game or do you want to play your game and playing your game is individual, right? So that's up to you. So I don't have an answer for that because that's based on you. But if you want to play the game in terms of what's the most success, then unfortunately, uh, if you're someone who, um, I can only speak for straight dating right now because that's the only environment I've been in. But if you're a man as I am and you want to take out a woman, then that's the way I'm forming it. You're taking out a woman, you have to pay. That's not something I believe in, but I understand what the game is mm -hmm. in terms of what success you want from that game, the game of dating in today's world. See what I mean? I like how you broke that down. Um, and like, you know, one of the reasons I asked you to kind of, you know, talk about your journey about getting your, the, the role that you have at Virus or um, Guelph Humber, Guelph Humber. Um, is, you know, I know that you had a, like a long path to kind of, you took all these like turns and twists and like you were oh, kind yeah. of building up the freelancing. Um, so along that journey, you know, what's like a prominent, I don't like the word failure, let's call it a learning experience, but Let's maybe we'll call it failure. What's been a prominent like failure that kind of really set you up for where you are today? Hmm. I think, I think uh, there's a lot of mini failures along the way. For me, that's complacency and just kind of sitting around thinking that an opportunity will come to you, whether it's uh, professionally or, or in the form of dating. You know, you, you you just might meet this person just like opening a door for them, or they might open the door for you. That. Yeah, we're not watching a Bollywood movie um, or in the same vein, networking, right? You just maybe you'll just stand in the corner. Maybe they'll come see you. That's not going to happen, right? You got to put yourself out there. So I would say complacency in, in terms of like the everyday failure. But I think um, the expectation that I, no matter what happens, I will make it. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of masks the hard work you have to put in. It's not even hard work, just maybe a lot of work, right? The, the, the quantity and quality, like you've said, they're together, right? It's not just one or the other. You, no matter how you get there, you you got to put in the work in some way or form. And I'm not even talking about, you don't have to, uh, I think we're obsessed with uh, staying up late, sleep is for the week, all that all that nonsense. It's just, you got to put in the work when you can. And as, as long as you're consistent, this is what I tell every student that wants to create a YouTube show or something, just like opening your own business, no matter what it is, real estate, anything. Maybe in the first two years, you won't even make a profit. But if you're consistent, and especially with YouTube, you'll have those videos historically categorized there that users can go and watch in the, in the past, in the future, the past ones. As long as they're there, you know you've done that, and eventually you'll get the viewers. And you, you, may, you brought up the, a great, like, I think consistency is a, like an underrated skill because just mainly because oh, yeah, it's yeah. mainly because it's a boring skill to have. Nobody wants to hear, <laughs> hey, just be consistent. Um, Yo, this guy's so sexy because he's consistent. <laughs> um, example of someone that like when you said consistent that I thought of where like they got the payoff like 10 years later. I think his name is Beeple. Beeple. He's like a, uh, the the uh, the artist. Yeah. So like yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I yeah. think for like ten NFTs, years. Yo, nifties. Well, like for ten years, he posted a piece of digital art for ten years every yeah. day on every Instagram, day. and literally, I don't know if he was doing well or not before this, but 
he got his big payoff like 10 years later. I'm not saying you're guaranteed success, but I think you nope. give yourself a better uh, percentage of succeeding. But like, I just think of that example, like this guy made $65 million from like one piece of digital art, but it's not that one art piece of art that got him that money. It was the 10 years that he put in. It's like, um, it's like paying a surgeon for 10 minutes of surgery. You're not paying them for the 10 minutes. You're paying them for like the 15 years of school and hours of like training they have to do. To yeah, do that, that crams into the 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Or like when I worked for a dance team, it was the same thing. You're not paying that dancer for that show. You're paying them for all the costumes, all the late nights that they practice to get you that immaculate show, right? Like, yes. so they're perfect. And that's why they cost whatever they cost. Yeah. yeah. And, and you mentioned kind of, you had this dream of kind of being an actor and we both know like Vaz, Vaz Serenga, shout out to him again. Him and his brother, they're like, yeah, I would say they're successful actors in their own right. Um, oh yeah, for sure. You, and, everyone should look them up. I, I'm sure our era woke you up. Yeah. So like, I mean, for like Vaz, I think he, he, this guy was like auditioning for like these small like bit parts and slowly over time, you know, he had commercials and then he got, you know, uh, significant parts in like TV shows. So like just kind of seeing that progression because if you didn't know him 10 years ago, but then you saw him in like one of, you know, I think he was in Orphan Black and like a few other shows. Yeah, Flashpoint like, wow, and all these Flashpoint, yeah. yeah. You're like, wow, like he really made it, but you didn't see like all those hours of kind of hard work and consistent work that he put in to get to this point. So um, you were saying like you, you would love to be an actor, but you also would hate to be an actor because you know the, the level exactly, of work exactly. and disappointment. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm realistic. I don't have the commitment right now to yeah. start really going into that avenue. Maybe yeah. one day, but mm -hmm. right not right now. <laughs> oh, man. Just thinking about it. It's, uh, it's funny. Um, yeah. Something else I wanted to kind of delve into was, you know, um, behind every great man, there's a great woman. And, you know, I'm sure that not just like your wife, but I'm sure you have other people that along your journey to where you are now that have kind of supported you. And maybe some that have kind of been like, hey, what are you doing? Like, like, what do you do for a living? Like, pick something. Um, <laughs> I'm I sure get, you've gotten that. I'm I, sure you've gotten I've that got, way more than I've gotten that. I get, I get like, that yo, Aaron, what do you do for a living? It's like, hold up. Can we talk about something else? Because I do a lot of things and you can't, you might not be able to handle it. <laughs> I feel like people get uncomfortable when I tell them I don't like to define myself by like what I do. Like I do a lot of different things and you might find it weird. But yeah, anyways, like for, what about for you? <laughs> Well, I, I feel like when you say something like that, they either think you're the biggest like hedge fund douchebag manager and like is going to roll out in a Rolls Royce or is just the janitor or something. So like they yeah. have no idea who you are. And I think that's great. Right. Um, yeah. For me, you know, for when it comes to the people supporting me, yes, I, I think uh, I was in engineering at first at UFT. Uh, I was one of those casualties that didn't make it. I, I struggled. I was not paying attention. I, I, I wanted to live that frat boy university life <laughs> yeah, at UFT, right? Yeah. Of course. Um, but so I, I, I was struggling and, and, you know, I was talking to my dad about it and he just did not support me quitting. Mm -hmm. Of course. Why would he? Like, that's, that's not who he raised, right? Um, but I did end up quitting um, because uh, I didn't care. I, I just didn't care. And, I, and through that year of progression, I tried to find out what I did care about. And so when I did finally get to Ryerson, do media, and even through, through this job, my dad was still telling people I was an engineer, you know, for the longest time. So, he, you know, in a way that's not really supporting what I do or treating me as a, a person rather, or his son rather than, or a person rather than the son that he wanted me to be, you know, like, I don't blame him. Again, survival of the fittest mentality. You got to tell your village elders that you're, you're succeeding too, right, through your son. Um, but everyone around me, my buddies, and now my wife, of course, they supported me. And one of the way the one of the biggest forms of support was when I moved in with my wife before she was my wife. I basically I described myself as homeless, like I didn't I did I, my freelance career wasn't the best. I wasn't bringing a lot of financials to the table. And that's tough, right? And but she still wanted me to move in. She still wanted me to she valued who I was. And that's so underrated. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it, it, I'll describe it as someone who is on like mat leave or something. Their paychecks are being garnished, right? So the other person really does have to put in that the, the other form of that financial support and emotional support. Yeah. So picture that without having a, the happiness of a baby coming away. So now you're just fighting about money all the time. So it, there was a lot of support from the people very close to me. And, and even you, um, you know, when we met, we never had ideas of doing any of this stuff. The technology wasn't even here, but we tried, we, we yeah. did everything. And through TC, like let's say TC on the street, we ushered in a wave of 
of, of Tamil content all over the internet that other organizations copied our show too. <laughs> They were there and, and we were cool with them. I just, I found it so flattering that they did that yeah. um, where they, where they would interview people um, yeah, at these events that we were at too. It was sometimes we'd be at the same event. It was like two different media outlets. It, it, it's like the whole community made it. Yeah. And I think we had a big hand in starting that. And so yeah. there was a lot of support from people like you who were in the inner circle of who I thought was a, a really respected person and someone I love to hang out. And that's what it's all about. Shout out to our Foodie Unites group. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, so what's so, what's up group for everyone who wants to be a part of it right um you brought up like a very interesting point about that support you got from joey around um you know when you're at your kind of financial low point because i've been there where like i was trying to like start the business or like starting the business but it wasn't really experiencing success i didn't want to take on a job because i felt like it would be distracting yes but you I know that came. i think that supportive person and you know in this case for both of us it's our like wives they you know for Claudia, like she pushed me to not view taking on a job as a bad thing, but more so, hey, maybe it's a way to kind of contribute for now, build up skills while you're getting paid to, you know, build up skills. But hey, yes. you have you have the desire and drive to still build up the business. Nobody's stopping you, still do that. So it's kind of like they're showing you almost tough love. And for me, anyways, I can't speak on you, but like it was like, hey, I still like you don't have to be successful, but you know, let's just try to um, bring some kind of finances or like have some kind of stability, but I want you to still pursue your dream. It's like, so when I, at the it's time, very I, didn't, nuanced. Yeah. I didn't appreciate it as much when it was happening, but now looking back, so huge, so underrated, like you were saying. So, yeah, no, I mean, nothing more to add to that. I, I think we've, we've both known about each other's journeys and how hard, how difficult it can be when you're in the trenches yeah. and hopefully you have someone there to help support you through that. Uh, whether it's a significant other a sibling as we've talked about or family friends whatever yeah and you know like we've had these journeys where we've tried a lot of different things and i think it's because yeah. we're both people that like to learn so like i know we trade a lot of videos or like you know like just things that we read or even podcasts that you know like that we like to listen to so like we're like lifelong learners so i think this question is perfect for you in the sense that you might not have one you might have several but what is a favorite book and or podcast that you've listened to in the last couple of years that's had like a huge impact on you or say significant? You know, in the last while I've been reading so many baby books, I can't even <laughs> tell what's going on in, in real, real fictional life. But um, in terms of podcasts, I always say like one of the same things to a lot of people ask about podcasts. And I always talk about free economics mm. and how that has shaped a great deal of the way I like to think. And I think I was already kind of there where someone would say something. I'm like, what's that from? Like, where does that saying come from? And I think that's where uh, at its core for economics explores. For example, really shortly, they found that in the nineties crime was really high and then it started going down and they wondered why. And they went back to Roe v. Wade, which was the abortion. Um, the first time they abolished abortion or the, the right to choose from the Texas, correct me if I'm wrong, I forget specifics, but so now you had an, now you had the law help out women who didn't want to have the ch child that they were pregnant with, maybe because of financial situations, right? So now you have a bunch of people who wouldn't be fit to be parents because of their situation, not have kids. Those kids 20 years later are not committing crimes. So crime went down because of Roe v. Wade and other things like that. So that's so strange. You would never know that, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you just have to look into all these other aspects. And I thought I loved how that podcast, firstly, it digests these things really easy for easily for someone to listen to, so a dummy like me to listen to. But then just all these intricate things that are just together in a web and uh, five, you know six degrees of separation. But that's how you get to point Z, right? It's crazy. Uh, I love that. I I think you sent me an episode on that included why paid parking downtown. It's like actually it's, a good thing. It's, it's purposeful, yes. Yeah. I, I know that's contrary to what uh, I, I know you're the, the guy lurking around looking for that free <laughs> spot. And ooh, ooh, hey, I do that too. If you're downtown anywhere in any city, you know how screwed up parking can be. But yeah. yeah I definitely agree. It's a, it's a great, I haven't listened to a lot of episodes except that one, but I've read the book and I agree with you. Um, you know, definitely. Yeah, based great, on the book, yeah. Definitely a great educator. Um, you know, in terms of other, like, what's maybe like a belief behavior, like a habit that's really changed 
or improved your life maybe in the last couple of years. Like for me, I'll give you an example, which is yeah, go for me, <laughs> just buying like a Fitbit and going for like a walk every day or trying every day for the last six months has been huge for me because I'm not really working out. That's like my workout and it's been like a huge thing for me. So what about for you? I think, um, I think just, just, I've been, a as, as you probably know, I, uh, other than the rants and stuff, everything, nothing's planned here in my, in this brain. <laughs> uh, whereas Joey's like the insane planner compared to me. So I do things like off the cuff. I just have random ideas and I'm, I'm that creative here and there. So I think just actually just writing down things that I need to do. It sounds stupid. Like I'm not talking about bullet journaling or anything like that. I've, I've explored that, seen that, but just literally just writing down a couple of things here and there and think, Hey, this, these are the things I need to do for my work day firstly. And then just, Hey, do we, do I, do I, am I going to skip today? Am I going to work out today? Yes. Because if I don't write it down, then it's like, I had this random fleeting thought and then I forget and then I'll play some Smash Brothers and then yeah. <laughs> that's my day, right? So to be more effective and I'm not going to say to be the best that I can be, but just just be someone <laughs> I can respect in the mirror, then <laughs> I I, uh, I like to write some stuff down. And, and even then I forget to do it a lot. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I started getting into digital to-do lists like yes, maybe that's, six, that's a great way to six, seven. Yeah, years I ago. even forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. doing that is helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, especially as you're becoming or about to become a father and, you know, I've thought about this more as a father now in terms of your personal legacy, how would you describe how you'd want to be remembered by friends and family? I, you know, I hate this because uh, I, I flashed back to like this party I was at and someone was talking about, it's all about the legacy you're going to create. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, this guy sounds like the biggest douche. Um, he wasn't a head fund, head fund, hedge fund manager. Um, but uh, I always talk about how at the end of the day, no one's a Beyonce, right? Like, and even Beyonce will be forgotten at one point. Even MJ will be forgotten, Michael Jordan and Jackson. But I think as long as the people around me know who I was, I'm talking about after the death, I guess, and they knew that I was the one who cared the most, that in their darkest days that I was there and that I could be someone they could depend on, that's it. I don't have great dreams of grandeur where my podcast would be Joe Rogan's. I would love to. And, 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 and professionally, that's great. But that's not how I define legacy. I define it with how my family and my friends um, remember me. And like, you can imagine like, what's your, like, if you can write your own eulogy or if you can be at your own eulogy, like, what would you want them to say? Right. Like, that's kind of what, do you really want them to be like, oh, he was a titan of the industry. You know? Yeah. That's, that's great in some ways when you're like, throwing out your D piece on the table. And it's like, Hey, this is me. But like, you know, that doesn't make you sleep better at night. I mean, I hope that's not what helps you sleep better at night. Hope it's more tangible with your family and friends. And I can actually attest to Ari actually believing what he's saying, because this man and his wife, um, I think me and Claudia were like one or two months in, I think I was sleeping in the floor of like the <laughs> twins, like um, nursery. Cause I was so tired and I didn't want to get up to like, you know, keep going back and forth between the bedroom. And when I woke up, I found, I think um, he had dropped off bubble tea for myself and Claudia, which is like so thoughtful. Um, so yes, this man is definitely a caring man. So I, well, well, I was surprised after when she told me that she never really drank bubble tea before. That's so surprising. But the crazy thing is now it's He's like, because of Uber it. Eats, it's all about the bubble tea. She's all like, about it. Which I'm happy about. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Because, uh, you know, for those who don't know, like when, when I would hang out with Aaron on some of that foodies crew you mentioned, He's randomly talking about bubble tea. Like he's, he's like, yo, are we going for bubble tea now? <laughs> I love Boba. it. Um, you know, obviously we're both Tamil. We both worked on or working on TamilCulture.com. So being Tamil, I think is, you know, I can say safely say is a big part of our identities. Um, for you personally, beyond kind of working on the Tamil culture, um, TamilCulture.com and kind of this um notoriety that you got by being the host of uh tc on the street i feel like everyone knows you and still like misses the show i feel like we need to reboot it or something um what has been the impact of the toronto tamil community on like both yourself personally and uh professionally i think um when i was growing up and like every other i think ethnic person there, there's probably a phase in your life where you, you were othered and you wanted to be you wanted to be white so it'd be easy you know, like when you bring your lunch to school and everyone else, like the white kids had bologna and you're like, oh, I want that bologna sandwich so badly. What is this curry stuff? It's sticking up the place. Or like, you know, like 
someone from another country is bringing their food and they're, they're thinking the same thing. So you finally get that bologna sandwich. And you're like, it was good the first time, but this is, does not taste good at all. Like this, this is trash. So I think embracing that and then seeing other people embrace it. And when you finally get the connections that, that, that thumbel person respects you too, just because they know what you're eating, it's just so subtle. And then every every year you just gain more and more friends and family that are just a part of that like little culture that unwritten rule it's almost like when a bald guy meets another bald guy they go hey <laughs> i know you're struggling you know like it's one of those things so it it, it, it it's, it's a huge underrated impact because you don't think about it and the best way to think about it is during this covid experience where a lot of families can't see their loved ones pass away unfortunately because of the protocols and then I think a, a white person told me, hey, listen, if this, if, if, if my dad had a funeral, there'd be like five people there. And I was like, why? It's like, our family's not big. And, you know, that's just how it was. And I'm like, that's so strange because as a kid, I've been to a million funerals with my parents, with anyone they knew from any village, you know? <laughs> so it's just not something I've thought about. So we just have this huge, huge community and that feels amazing. And it sucks that when someone doesn't have that. And, you know, uh, it's interesting you brought up the ta Toronto Tama community. I think I think we also take for granted how strong and like vibrant the community here is compared to other like pockets. Because I was talking to Vuzi, who's like an um, entrepreneur and like rapper in Seattle. He's like, I would die for what you guys have in Toronto. He's like, because I, I was talking about how like in Scarborough, like where my parents live, instead of a grocery store every block, they have like a Tamil grocery store. Like, yeah. it's like, it's like these small things you don't, you just take for granted. And, you know, you're talking about food and like, you know, how we're embarrassed to kind of take food. It's so Not funny. Anymore. I Not would anymore. like, I, I, you know what I was craving randomly? Me and Claudia were talking about it. You know, those like sandwich makers we used to have back in the day and they would put leftovers <laughs> in there. Yes. Oh yeah. I, I would, cr I would like desperately want like a Tamil sandwich full of like leftover, like mutton curry. Or oh yeah. You get the potatoes and the oh, in there spiced God. up with that sandwich maker. It's like the best of both worlds. <laughs> I'm ashamed that I was ashamed of that food back then, but <laughs> honestly, like it's easy to say that I, yeah. and I know you would be, and I know everyone is, but that's just, I mean, it's just how it was like yeah. wherever you grew up, if you weren't, especially if you like all these people that weren't in the Toronto, Toronto area, they were growing up in some other city and they were just, they were, and they would be the only one that would suck. Yeah. yeah. Where we were blessed enough to not have that. I mean, there was, there was at least four other people at the table also eating their curry in silence. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, who would you say is like a person, I feel like you're gonna have a good answer for this because of your breadth of knowledge. So who's one person in the global Tamil community and one per, like one non-Tamil person in the global community that you admire and why? Can I say my parents? No, um, no definitely. I, you probably I, I mean, I mean, yes, of course I admire my parents. Everyone knows the immigrant struggle, right? It's just underrated when, 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 when I think of like all the times I buy anything and my dad would never buy a Tim Hortons coffee, like just, he would just never buy it. It was like, I, you think I can afford that? How are you going to get to school tomorrow? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so uh, I think um, there, if anyone knows the realm of comedy, uh, they might know a name, Jay Chandrasekhar or Chandra Seeker, he is the one of the OG Tamil media guys. Let's call it that. Um, if I uh, look up a movie called Super Troopers, he's uh, the, the, the main character is a Tamil guy. Oh, I, he's, he's, I mean, he's Tamil, like he, as the person. He, he's playing a guy who's a, a cop, but he's one of the main guys. And, and, his, and he was like one of the original comedians that no one knows about, like a mainstream wouldn't know about. But he directs a lot of comedies like he's guest spotted on the office 30 rock a lot of these just look him up you'll you'll see he has a crazy mustache he's a he's an amazing he's an amazing og of the comedy world especially for tamil so what i'll say and why i bring him up is because without him there wouldn't be um, aziz there wouldn't be mindy kaling they looked up to him in a way to see that hey this guy's making it in a, in a typically all white space at the time. And we're talking about the early nineties here, right? Um, when this guy was doing his, all, um, like his, uh, what am I looking for? All his, in his comedy troupe and stuff like that. So that's a big influence when I was growing up because I just luckily saw super troopers. I'm like, Hey, this guy's name at the end credit is really long. I'm going to look him up. I think he's from, he's, he's Indian, just like, you know, Aziz and Mindy are, but they're, they're all thumbled. So that, that's crazy. It's, it's just yeah. nuts. Um, so the, I have to, I would say him as for a non-thumble, I haven't really thought of that. I, I don't think I've really 
gravitated towards anyone specifically. I mean, I really like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think he's That's he's dope. dope. Um, yes, yeah, the, the fan. He's <laughs> if he's on a lot of podcasts, and he he wrote uh, some really nice starter books for anyone who's dabbling into astronomy. He's one of those guys that's so smart that when he watches a movie called like, you know, you know, the movie Titanic, yes. he watches that. And in the scene where Jack is about to die because Rose can't let him on the damn door. <laughs> he's like, wait a minute, the constellations are wrong. That's crazy. Yeah. He's like, that's wrong. That's not what the sky should look like. I'm like, enjoy the movie, man. <laughs> but like, I, he's just a really, really brilliant guy. And he, he, he speaks about it and really eloquently. And I like that. And I think he's one of the guys I like randomly listen to. That's first, you know, I think four or five people have said their parents and then they've kind of given some other answers. So I definitely see some. I thought I had to throw in the the communal answer there. Yeah, to... yeah but it's true, though. It's definitely true. Um, you know, this podcast is called The Tamil Creator. For those of you that don't know, again, why I started it, it was just really to kind of provide a space for not just the Mindy Kalings or like, you know, Aziz and Saris of the world, uh, but like others that are kind of really doing meaningful, impactful work or making a change in kind of their sphere of influence and, you know, people like Ari here. So that's kind of why I wanted to create this to kind of share those stories. Um, so Ari, like what would be a piece of advice that you would share with other aspiring Tamil creators? Um, yeah, just to kind of, yeah, a piece of advice you'd give them, yeah. I would say, um, yes, be consistent. That's probably the most overarching thing. But when it comes to money, I see this a lot in a lot of creators that are especially young. Even my students, they're like, I would charge this client this much. And I'm like, why? Why, why, do you, why would you charge them anything when they don't see any of your work? Unfortunately, when you're freelancing in the arts, especially, you don't have tangible work that they, that they can like grade tangibly versus if you were in, if you were a CA and you work somewhere, it's easy for them to understand what you do. Um, you're always bringing from wild card attributes to the table so i would say especially in the form of let's say video photography do know your worth but if you get free jobs if you have the opportunity to do free jobs do them because when you you're looking for the job like i'm saying you're, you're looking for the next one so if you do a couple free jobs here and there do them if you are underpaid here and there do them because eventually you'll get overpaid for a lot of stuff. And that's the, that's the beauty of having the experience. And especially when you do free jobs, that's when you're learning, right? There's not a lot of pressure. So just do everything that you can to get your skills at a better level, not necessarily your pocket in a, you know, with filled with money because money will come. It will, it just will. But don't be so focused on that, that it won't, that it takes away the creativity. Then you're just working for money and that doesn't, ultimately I get it, but, that's not really why you wanted to be passionate about something, right? Love it. Great advice, Ari. Um, you know, that can kind of conclude the serious part of our discussion. Serious. Now I'm, you know, excited to kind of delve into what I call Would You Rather? And I feel like oh, shit. I've been preparing for Ari because, like I said, Ari is quite knowledgeable across different subject matters. But I feel like, you know, these questions I think a lot of people resonate with. And I'm very curious to I feel see. I like I'm on Jeopardy now. Um, let's start with an easy one. So the first one is mutton rolls or kotha roti? Um, I say mutton rolls because you can eat them anywhere. You don't need a spoon. That's a great answer. Okay. Or a fork. Tom Brady or Michael Jordan? I'd say Regency bias right now. I grew up with Michael Jordan. I cried when I couldn't get one of his books from the Scholastic stuff. I don't know if people remember <laughs> that. Um, but I would say Tom Brady because he has had more opportunity to be clutch and be rated on that. I know he doesn't play defense like Jordan did because that's the nature of his game. But, you know, because Jordan had stacked teams a lot of the, along the way and a Hall of Fame coach, not that Brady, Brady doesn't. Yeah, he just never had to be in a clutch situation. Like he never had to really go game seven in the finals. Mm. It's not his fault, of course, but yeah. that, there points. you go. Plus, he was way more athletically gifted than Brady. Brady, I can run faster than Brady. You know, and I'm all five foot, foot two, right? So, come and, on. And you know that I hated Brady for the longest time. Oh, man, I love I love the fact that you hated him because but, he proved so many of your core theories right. But then reluctantly, I had to admire the man because I saw that video of what he looked like as a six-round or whatever pick he was. One ninety-nine. that body type. I probably had a better body than he did. <laughs> yeah. And, and this we man, all do. And this man is now what like a six or seven time super bowl champion 
I think he has seven. He has seven. Does he have more than six? Jordan? I think he has six or seven. Yeah, he definitely has. Hold on. Uh, as you talk, I can think. I can bring this out. Rams, St. Louis. Who's the third one? Eagles, then Seattle. Oh man, the Seattle one was crazy. Seattle was insane. Um, and so was the, so was the the, the Atlanta oh. Atlanta. So that's five. Yeah. Rams six, and then yeah, he has seven. So he just won again, right? With Tampa Bay, he has seven. So maybe he's the goat. Um, Friends or Seinfeld? Depends on the day. I, I would lean towards Seinfeld more. I think that goes back to. The, the core of humor for me and i think it's way more substantial and ingenious friends is more typical um but it it is very charming so i'm glad like you it. said that i feel like more people said friends because i feel like seinfeld the more i watched it the more i appreciated how yeah it's a show but nothing but it's like i don't know something there's something ingenious about the show i can't verbalize it it's just something about the, the show the, i can speak about that forever but i would say the problem with seinfeld is it ended earlier than friends and uh, as social media and every form got bigger friends was still around friends is more iconic with um female okay. viewers women just because it it was and, and seinfeld was typically more of a man show at the time hmm. um christopher would you rather be christopher nolan or denzel washington um I think I'd rather be Nolan because you're just behind the scenes. Your your creativity has you're 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 graded on the overall picture versus just one aspect of it. Hmm. In in for, in for in the form of acting versus the director is the top person. Hmm. Plus you don't you're not you're not so as flashy as as an actor would be. Even though that's that's cool. You could just be behind in the shadows. Interesting. I thought you would have said Denzel based on your uh, well, his, aspirations. <laughs> honestly, like yo, know, his gravitas, yeah, it goes for you know, it speaks for itself, right? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was really interesting hearing that story with um, oh my goodness, Black Panther. What's his name? Why well, can Chadwick Boseman? Yeah, when he talked about Denzel's kind of impact, like that's such a crazy story. Um, this is a shout out to kind of your heritage and the other heritage, not your Tamil one, but Toronto or Paris. <laughs> well toronto's home paris is no, i was born in paris but i never really grew up there my family some of my family is there but no toronto's home you, you get the, the best cuisine here because it's so diverse mm. obviously paris has their their strengths their their bread is to die for of course you know if you get if you get that pawn over there you know <laughs> you know it's, it's it's amazing but when you're here you just have the opportunity to have so many different things mm. and that is super underrated because you know, obviously in the media space, everyone's talking about how New York is diverse, but I'm like, it is diverse, but here we have more of that, I think. Yep, agreed. Um, condo or house? My answer is it depends on the state of your life. <laughs> <laughs> but um, ultimately, if, 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 okay, if all things were equal, let's say the, let's say if the spaces or something were somehow equal or even somewhat equal, let's say a three bedroom condo, condo versus like a, a three floor mega house, I would still take the condo. I think I like, I like my space, but not that much. I, and I grew up in both situations. I grew up downtown in a small apartment with my parents. And then I grew up all like the, the rest of my youth was in a house in Scarborough. I have both world, bust of both worlds when it comes to growing up. I feel like most people only have one and that's how they attribute to. Like even my brother's younger and he still wants a house. I'm like, why do you need a house? He's like, I, I just want space. I'm like, you you want it now until you have to clean it, but, <laughs> but I understand when you have a family, it's just more realistic to have a house. Realistic, but doesn't mean that that could be work work for everyone. Yeah, I personally still don't get the house thing, but to each their own. Uh, yeah, you're just uh, you're the you're the guy who just has to counter everything. It's like, hey, everyone's buying a house. No, Claudia, no. <laughs> I feel like part of me does that for that, but I think it's more so it's a practicality part of it where. If I could, my dream would be like a three bedroom condo overlooking Absolutely. the water, Absolutely. where I have access to amazing amenities, um, close to like downtown versus like, I guess I'm just like, I'm very time centric, like anything that takes away time from like me enjoying life, which I feel like a house does. But again, maybe people have other solutions for that. It just isn't worth it for me, especially the cost of like a house in Toronto, like with the market going crazy. It doesn't uh, yeah, I, it. You know how it goes. Historically, if you own property, 
you're the man, right? Or yeah. you're the woman, you're the whatever. That's how our parents, I'm, I'm viewing it as how our parents would talk about it. Why don't you get a house? Oh, I would never pay that. Why are you paying rent when that could be a mortgage? I'm like, yeah, throw me the down payment like every other kid I know <laughs> who talks about how they have a huge house. Then yeah, we'll talk then. Yeah. But that's not happening. So, <laughs> And also I'm speaking from my lovely condo here with my dog on that side, just making dream sounds. Well, the, well, the condo looks pretty cozy. So, uh, And it's a great spot downtown too. Um, Toyota or Tesla? Oh, I would say Toyota for now. I mean, like you can get that shit repaired anywhere. <laughs> well, if anyone has a Tesla, they know that they have to install their electrical charger and that, that's a pretty penny itself. I mean, once that network's done, man, yeah, the answer will change. But right now, and even for the next maybe 10 years, I would, I would go for Toyota. And I know you went for the alliteration with the T's, but even Honda, whatever it is, you know. Yeah, I think even uh, I'm a Toyota person now, but I think the more people I hear answering tesla and the reasons for it like the um the self-driving network eventually if that ever gets kind of built out and if um charging becomes more accessible like if it's at like every gas station mm -hmm. maybe my yeah. answer changes yeah yeah that's what i mean like it, the answer now shouldn't be tesla for anyone really yeah it, it's not attainable right now but yeah. it, it, it's cool but especially in our weather i think it kind of diminishes it a little too but um, man, the Teslas are so good. Like they have like HEPA filters everywhere. They got, it's also good for people who aren't confident in their driving. I mean, it just saves you in so many ways with all the sensors. Yeah. My, my car doesn't have Bluetooth. I mean, come on. <laughs> what are we talking here, right? <laughs> it's so funny because I don't think I had Bluetooth until like my most recent car, um, like vehicle that we got. And it's, it was such a game changer because I didn't realize that I could listen to Spotify in my car. That's like it was that. crazy. Um, but yeah. That's that kind of concludes the fun speed run. I think that's the most questions I've had, only because I thought there would be a more controversial. To be honest, I thought you were going to get more controversial. I I was if thinking, you have one, you can you can throw it in right now. I was thinking about it, but I feel like you know I think uh, I think we we hit a good threshold of like maybe approaching controversial, but not really. And that's for, that's feel, for your Patreon, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, that kind of concludes. You know, the uh, podcast, you know, Ari, it was uh, definitely a pleasure to kind of talk to you. And I feel like people are going to be excited to hear this. I think for those of you that are like uh, TC on the street fans or just people that already know Ari, I think um, I don't think you often get to hear somebody's conversation with somebody else, which is why I think podcasts are like really unique. Um, so I think people are kind of going to really enjoy this. So Ari, for everyone that, you know, wants to connect with you, maybe they're interested in like a career in media or like. They want to know how to kind of build up, you know, the uh, contract jobs or just want to hang out with you because like you're a fun, interesting guy. Uh, how do they reach out to you? How do they connect with you? Yeah, I always say that uh, people are wasting time all the time. So if you just want to waste your time with me, then I would feel honored. Right. So <laughs> um, I think Instagram's the best way. I tell my students that as well to just uh, DM me. Right. Like as long as it's appropriate, of course, it's just a really low key way where no one's on a computer typing emails and stuff. If we get to that level professionally, of course. Um, my Instagram handle is Hey There Ari, like Hey There, and then A R I, and I'm I'm sure Arrow will list that out. Yes, uh, it's pretty easy. Yes, uh, send me a message. Just say hi. I'll say awesome. hi back. Awesome. And you know, for those of you listening, I got to go through this, but please give this podcast a five out of five. It really helps your visibility and whatever you're listening to, Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. Please comment, share, 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 and like our stuff on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter and Twitter. And if you have any feedback or ideas on future guests or even specific topics, please reach out to me at hello at the .com. Thank you so much guys. And uh, see you guys in the next one. Have a great one, everyone. Bye.